Good morning. I'm Ben Ayers, Dean of the Terry College of Business. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our Terry Third Thursday series. Uh, this is our monthly event that is hosted by our alumni board. I'd like to thank them for their efforts for today's event and this entire series. Uh, please also join me in thanking our sponsors, uh, Synovus, as well as Atlanta Public Broadcasting, WABE. So please join me in thanking them as well. Uh, next month, we'll have uh, Jenna Drosis. Jenna is the uh, CEO of Signet Jewelers. Um, also coming up in May, we've got Mohammed Masterclaw. You probably remember that name from Georgia football. He's managing, managing director of Vessel. And then to round out this first half of the year in June, we've got Sal Abate, who is the CEO of Veritive Corporation. And uh, so we've got an outstanding lineup, not only today, but through uh, this summer. Uh, and I'm going to now invite Scott O'Sadell to come up and to introduce today's speaker. Scott O. Good morning. Um, my name is Scott O'Sadell, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, CEO of Ted's Montana Grill, and good friend of mine, George McCaro. George's work has shaped the trajectory of the American hospitality industry for the last 30 years. Founder of Longhorn Steakhouse and co-founder of Ted's Montana Grill, George caught the hospitality bug when he started working in restaurants as a teenager. He invented the casual dining concept in 1981 when he opened the very first Longhorn Steakhouse and went on to establish the chain nationwide. His management company, Rare Hospitality International, also created the Capitol Grill and Bugaboo Creek concepts before he retired in 2001. However, his experiment in retirement only lasted one year. In 2002, George teamed up with Atlanta entrepreneur, media mogul, and philanthropist Ted Turner to create Ted's Montana Grill. Since then, he has expanded its brand of eco-conscious American fare to 39 restaurants in 16 states. And George, I'm pretty sure my family has patronized every single one of those. <laughs> you have good reason. <laughs> uh, George has or is currently serving on the board of directors of the National Restaurant Association, the Culinary Institute of America, Captain Planet Foundation, uh, Atlanta Family Meal Foundation, and the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau. Also, he has received many awards and accolades, including Lifetime Achievement Award from the Georgia Restaurant Association in 2007, induction into the Atlanta Hospitality Hall of Fame, and Restaurant Tour of the Year by Share Our Strength for his commitment to the National No Kid Hungry campaign. Please join me in welcoming my friend, George McCaro. Thank you, Scotto. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm George McCaro, and I'm honored to be here this morning. I'm here this morning to just kind of share with you a little bit of my story. I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a proud Georgian. I also call myself a Southern Fried Yankee. Uh, I was born in Wisconsin and went to school at Ohio State University. Went to school from 1968 to 1972. It was a pretty tumultuous time in our history, as many of us remember. <clears throat> and um, I thought I wanted to go to law school, didn't do real well at it, but I ended up graduating and going down to a local place called Smuggler's Inn and getting a job as a bartender. And I remember my father coming down and sitting across the bar and saying, so son, let me get this right. I just paid for your education. You're supposed to be going to law school and here you are attending bar. I said, oh dad, don't worry about it. I'll go next year. I'm having a great time making a lot of money, chasing a lot of girls having a lot of fun. I'll go be a lawyer. Well, that was 40 some years ago and I never quite made it to law school, but I got the restaurant bug. And um, our industry, I do believe, and I'll just say this right now, is probably one of the most misunderstood industries in the country. Um, I don't know if you looked at the job numbers last, last week that came out of the 300 and some thousand jobs created, over 100,000 of those were in the service sector in the restaurant hospitality business. You know, there's no glass ceilings, there's upward mobility. I started as a busboy and a dishwasher. 
I ended up the CEO and founder of, of a couple of restaurants. Uh, I can go down the line. The majority of the presidents and CEOs of major restaurant chains all started as hourly team members. So the upward mobility is there. And so I found the industry to be very, very fascinating and rewarding for me. Um, so, you know, I got a job after college, and I got a job with a company called Victoria Station. How many people might remember that? There was the second one ever built was down here at, at Lindbergh, and actually they took that company public after two restaurants, right after this one was built. So what you had back then was the beginning of the casual dining, particularly steakhouse business. You had Cork and Cleaver, Steak and Ale, Chart House, Victoria Station, et cetera, and they were the first you know, chain restaurants that went nationwide, and they had meteoric rises, and then later, well, there's very few of any of those restaurants left, but they created a whole new segment in the industry, and I went to work during that time, and I learned a lot, but it's the only job I've ever had working for somebody else. Luckily for me, they, I went to uh, school there in, in California and really wanted to stay, but they sent me back to Cincinnati, Ohio, the last place I wanted to go. <laughs> I spent about six months in Cincinnati, and the opportunity to come to Atlanta came up. And I took a job and, and started running a restaurant as a lowly assistant manager at Northlake called Quinn's Mill. Some of you may remember it behind Northlake Mall. <clears throat> and um, my first day, I was in charge of light bulbs and, and the parking lot. So I had a lot of authority and a great deal of responsibility. Well, five months later, I was the general manager of the restaurant, and a year and a half later, I was, the, I was the southeast regional manager running 10 restaurants here. And I learned a lot in that job. I learned many, many things that have helped me in my career, but I'm really not one to like to work for somebody else. So I had a friend come to me, and he said, there's this honky-tonk Texas Steakhouse that you've got to take a look at with me. You're one of the best restaurateurs I've ever met. Let's go build this. I've got the money lined up. Well, I was 30 years old. I'd never been to the lawyer's office except for to get divorced by then. Sorry about that. I'd never been to the accountant's office except for to help me with my taxes. And I really didn't understand something. This is the first business principle that I learned. Um, this is where I learned that, you know, like good fences make good neighbors, good paper makes good partnerships. Having a clear understanding of who's going to do what, when they're going to do it, how we, what responsibility is going to fall where. This is, this is an essential part of a successful business, especially young businesses, because when we started, right, I mean, we were convinced that we had the greatest idea we were going to be the most successful. We were going to get really, really rich, and we we're going to make it really, really easy. And that rarely, if ever, comes true. It takes a great deal of hard work, and you find that you have a lot of slip and falls and failures along the way. So, you know, I didn't have that. I had a handshake. I was supposed to get 25% for doing the work. He was supposed to have the money, and off we went. When I went to where I left my job, and I went to work at Carlos McGee's. How many people ever remember a bar named Carlos McGee's? So I worked at Carlos McGee's. We were open until 4 in the morning. So I worked there at night as a bartender to pay the rent. And then I got up the next morning, went down and built the restaurant uh, with, along with a small friend of mine that was building it. So there we are on that 40 mile an hour curb with a one way driveway in an old Mike Thevis yellow front adult bookstore. Probably not the number one location you'd want to be in for a restaurant. And um, my partner disappears. And this is another life lesson. I had a choice. You know, I'd been Southeast Regional Manager, but I had a dream in my pocket. And I thought I had a good idea, and I had a solid business plan. And I could have left and just gone and gotten a job at a, another restaurant chain and probably worked my way through and done whatever with my career. But I really wanted to follow through with what I had started, and I thought that that, that I was on to something. So I rewrote the business plan. I went to my father and two other partners, and we raised enough money to buy our, the original guy out for 50 cents on the dollar. We went to work again to build the first Longhorn on Peachtree Road. And, you know, again, we all thought we were going to be an overnight success. 
hired a couple of managers, hired a whole team, had 300 of my friends in for free food and beverage, you know, the night before, great big party, got all these pictures, opened the door the next day, and we did 14 lunches and 21 dinners. And I quickly realized that we weren't really going to be an overnight success. So I literally let everyone go, except for a very few people. And I would cook at lunch, at dinner times, at dinner, I would greet you at the front door, take your order, make your drink, cook your food, deliver your food, and collect for it. And that brings me to another point about this unique about the restaurant business. We're the only industry that orders, receives, manufactures, sells, produces, delivers, and collects for its product all in one day. And we're only as good as the next person that opens the front door that comes in. So we'll talk about it in a minute because when, when you go to investment bankers or Wall Street and you tell them the only thing predictable about the restaurant business is unpredictable and we're only as good as the number of people that come through the door and we can't really predict that, it's not really a solid foundation for them to build their business models off of, is it? So this is one of the difficult natures of our business. So we'll fast forward, you know, the restaurant, I worked it and for about 22 months. Uh, we got some recognition. We got a couple of lucky breaks. There was a snowstorm in there where we stayed open, and I got five of the Atlanta Falcons to play uh, softball for me, and then that got us on television and got some recognition. And before you knew it, the restaurant was thriving. We built a second restaurant out in East Cobb. It was very successful in the beginning, and we started our adventure starting about 1983 of growing the company. We grew the company to about 30 restaurants by 1992 with a couple of franchises in there. And there was a frenzy. By then, the Outback guys had come in and said, we're just going to take Longhorn and make it you know, Australian theme, but we're going to take the same idea. I actually partnered up with, with uh, a couple of guys and was a part owner in Lone Star Steakhouse, but at the time it wasn't called Lone Star, we called it Chisholm's. We opened about six restaurants and then I got out of that. So there was a beginning to be this rumblings of this Texas Honky Tonk Saloon idea out there, you know, uh, really high quality steaks and great adult beverages, but but you know, in kind of a down-home atmosphere. If you remember Longhorn One, we threw peanut shells on the floor. We had bullshit on the wall. A couple of things like that. So, you know, we were a little irreverent. And um, <clears throat> so, anyway, the the rest kind of is history, right? I mean, by 1992, we made the decision to take the company public. And this is a big decision, and I would say I have nothing against Wall Street, but as I said earlier, for the restaurant business, it's a difficult jump because, you know, you've got a lot of MBAs making models and predicting, and it's just not how our business is. But anyway, we set out, and we built 18 uh, restaurants in the next 24 months, and um, we also got into the advertising business, and you know, we, we, we tried to play the game, I guess. And I was Entrepreneur of the Year for the Southeast region from Ernst & Young, and the next day we missed our earnings by two cents and our stock plummeted by 70%. And, you know, when you're a young company, you've passed out a lot of stock options, you've given people incentives, uh, plus you're being reported of Wall Street. Well, that started a whole new adventure for me to learn uh, what it's like to have corporate raiders want to take over, have people call you up and tell you they lost their entire life savings buying your stock and could you pay them back and all sorts of other interesting things. But, um, you know, we weathered the storm by I went out and hired a professional management company to come in and take over and, and we righted the ship in 94 and 95 and then Things went a little bit crazy, and in 1996, I planned to retire, but I came back uh, in as a president, CEO, and chairman of the board and put together another new management team, uh, which I'm really proud of because they ended up uh, taking that company the next 10 years and selling it to Darden Restaurants for $1.4 billion in cash with several hundred Longhorn restaurants. There's now 600 of them. Phil Hickey was the CEO, Gene Lee. They all ended up, uh, Gene is a, a, a retired now, but ended up running all of Darden restaurants. So we did buy the Capitol Grill along the way when there was only three of them. We did have Bugaboo. We divested ourselves of that. So the story goes, and, and really the brand has 
maintained uh, quality, I believe. I'm still proud of the brand, but it really wasn't my thing. Partially because restaurants that are under control of financial institutions, again, are looking for predictability, so they begin to make boil-in-the-bag microwave almost as good as food. And I'm in the restaurant business. Um, on the side, I will say uh, something, uh, two things. Um, I also created in 1994 an Alice Waters Farm to Table, Georgia, local grown uh, inspired restaurant uh, called Canoe over on the river. And proud to say it's still here today and had kind of an institution in Atlanta. It was a little bit ahead of its time. Also created a restaurant with my partner Jerry called Aria, which is 28 on the Zagat Guide, one of the best restaurants in the southeast. So did a few things along the way. I also stepped out, tried to get in the church's chicken business, but got out of that. Lost a lot of money doing it, but I got out of it. So I went back to, to Rare and put together that management team. Then by 2000, which happens to a lot of folks, and I don't I, I don't begrudge this, but lots of times the very professionals you hire are the ones that come to you through the board of directors and say, you know, you're the entrepreneur and you're the founder, but we really don't need you here anymore. We got this. And that happened to me and it happened to my current partner, Ted Turner, about the same time. And so I just want to say one thing since we are talking to the University of Georgia, um, and Jessica's here today, I had an agency uh, called uh, the Sharbo Agency. Ron Sharbo was a well-known marketing uh, person here in Atlanta. And we created, talking about Longhorn, uh, a commercial that uh, became the number one re requested song in the state of Georgia, and it started in Athens. And later on, the university did a whole study uh, in the marketing department about the program because it was unbelievably successful. And we, we capped it all off. We made a television commercial. We spent, I think, $15,000 to make three television commercials up at a little farm I own. And as an afterthought, we had a majorette, a, a girl in an old majorette outfit singing the song and twirling the baton, and that was it. And um, all of a sudden, we got a call said uh, from the Addies. Everybody know what the Addies are? Sort of like the, the trophy that you want to get. Said, uh, are you coming to the National Addy Award? And we said, oh, heavens no, it's all the way out in Seattle. We, it's cost us more money to go there than it did to make the commercial. And they said, well, you probably ought to come. And so we went, and uh, Bernard Shaw, I'll never forget, announced it. It wasn't a New York agency. We beat out Saturn and Pepsi and Longhorn won the national Addy for the majorette talking about Longhorn. And so, you know, I mean, we had some luck along the way, but we also created some, some vibrations about what Longhorn was, which is a little bit more than just a place to get nourishment, but a place to entertain yourselves, to feel better when you leave than when you come in. And that's been something that I'm really proud of. So there it was in 2001, and I retired, so to speak. Uh, didn't really know what I was going to do. Had the thing that was on the board at Culinary Institute of America. And I had this concept in the back of my mind for gourmet hamburgers and, and kind of an old-fashioned setting of beer and wine only, malted milkshakes, homemade cookies, and things from my, from my childhood, really, and great chicken grills and, and blue plate specials. And I wrote it all up, and by then, uh, through Rutherford, Scotto's brother and, and Laura, who we'd become good friends with, we had I started to have a conversation about Ted being in the bison industry. If you remember, he got into the bison industry. The bison industry was trying to grow. I'll just give you a couple statistics. At that time, there was about 300,000 bison alive in the world. To give you an idea, comparison, there's 100 million cattle alive in the United States of America alone. Okay. On any given day, there's about 135,000 cattle taken to market in the United States alone. Worldwide that year, there was 26,000 bison taken to market for the entire year. So when I say it's a niche, niche industry, it was a niche industry. However, Ted was the largest bison rancher, and the bison group had gotten together in a co-op, and these guys had invested heavily, and unfortunately, when they took their their product to market after two years, they got an IOU rather than 
payment. And you know, that doesn't work real well at the bank when you're factored because you come in and go, well, I didn't get paid, but here's my IOU. I'd like some more money to keep operating. So the industry was plummeting. <clears throat> and I had helped consult with them to say, let me see if I can introduce it to some restaurants. I tried to introduce it to Rare Hospitality. Those folks that are smarter than I am said, oh, no, no, it'll hurt the margin, won't work. And then I went to some other, and the bigger guys that could have made it, helped it, well, they, it wasn't enough of it. And then the mom and pops were going to take only the primal cuts. So we had a four and a half year supply of bison in the marketplace, and Ted was delivering bison and was owed $9 million by the co-op. So I wrote this paper and sent it to him. I uh, had met Ted, but I didn't really know him. And in May of, of 2001, we were in California together, and he came and said, George, let's talk about this restaurant idea. And I said, OK. He said, I love it. Let's go do it. I'll own 80. You own 20. You get paid. I don't. Let's build these restaurants. And I had said, I thought that the way to bring bison to America's table was exactly that. Bring it in a restaurant, do it right, and people will go out and ask for it at their grocery store. So we had four, four pillars of principle, which by the way, 21 years later, we have nothing but a handshake between us. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful partnership. Um, he's truly uh, someone that you can count on to, to be totally supportive of what we do. But we had four principles. One was save the great American bison. It belongs in North America. It is a North American species. Number two was help the bison ranchers, which were plummeting. I mean, people were literally you know, losing their ranches and their farms and going broke because they couldn't get paid for their product. And so the industry was plummeting. Save those bison. S second of all, if you, you know, it's public knowledge. At that point, Ted had about two million acres of beautiful ranch lands, mostly uh, suitable for bison ranching. And, you know, he too had been invited off the bus over at Time Warner, AOL, and all of that merging. And so we had kind of a kindred spirit there. Um, but he wanted to create a financial uh, situation or cash flow for his future generations to be able to hold on to all of this land cost millions of dollars. And at the time, you know, he was funding the bison ranching to about $20 million a year. But he wanted, he saw it as the future and a way to, for the family. He didn't want to be in any other business, so to speak. A little bit of tourism, a little bit of, of, of hunting, but he really wanted to be in the, in the bison ranching business, better for the environment, meets up with his standards, and they belong on these ranches. And so, and the fourth pillar was to create a restaurant company that we could be proud of and that was profitable. And so we set out, and um, uh, from a blank piece of paper in July of 2001, we opened the first restaurant in January of 2002, which is only six months. So that's menu, leases, concept, design, build, um, you name it. Anything that you see in a Ted's Montana Grill today was created in that six month window uh, of opportunity. And we opened, in spite of 9-11, we opened on January 10th in Columbus, Ohio. I chose three markets to open in. One, obviously Atlanta, but I felt like it was gonna be biased uh, because of Ted and because of me. Uh, I chose Columbus, Ohio for a Midwest test, and I chose Denver, Colorado because it was the number one consumption of bison in the country. And we opened uh, two in Denver, one in Nashville, one in, two in Atlanta, and one in Columbus in the first 12 months. So we opened six Ted's Montana Grills in the first 12 months we were in business. Should have stopped there and operated those restaurants better. But I'll just give you a couple anecdotes. When Ted Turner was not one at that point that at least I knew how to say no to. So he would come into our board meeting and say, I want 30 new restaurants next year. And say, ooh, that's not going to happen. He'd say, well, Bob, give them $30 million. Go build the restaurants. I'd say, well, that's not going to happen. But anyway, we built 12 the second year, double, tri tripled the size of the company. We built 15 the third year. We built. 12 the fourth year. And we ended up building 56 restaurants in 72 months. 
it's a lesson I'd learned with Victoria Station. It's a lesson I'd seen happen, but I fell right into the same trap. We built too many restaurants too fast. We're in 19 states. And um, I remember, you know, coming to the harsh realization that our business is people. We're in the people business. Without people, we can't do it. And I think anybody in business knows that successful leaders surround themselves with great people and create a culture and core values that people can live and breathe by. And that's what we had done by Long, at Longhorn over time. And I think if you look at any successful company, they can really look and see solidly that it was all about the people and it was about the buy-in and people having a clear vision of what the company stands for, what direction they want to go in, and what their goals and accomplishments are that will be mutually beneficial to them and the environment in which they operate. Well, we really didn't have a whole lot of time to do that. We had some of those ideas, but we really didn't have a lot of time. So we had tremendous turnover in the restaurants, and so I equate it to the fact that, you know, we just basically we're almost every month opening a new restaurant. You know, everybody's energy goes to the opening of the new restaurant, right? They don't really care too much about it. Sort of like, you know, oh, yeah, they'll be fine. So we had to make a tough decision, and we stopped our growth in 2008 and 9, and we withdrew. And over the time, we've added a few back. We've lost a few. We had some restaurants that uh, didn't do well. And so today, we operate approximately 40 restaurants in 16 states. And um, you know, our company is extremely healthy. But I want to say this. Ted's Montana Grill did exactly what those four pillars did. We can prove statistically through the National Bison Association that every city that we went to, demand was created. Um, because people ate it properly cooked. Bison has to be cooked slow and low, and it's a little bit different. It, 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 it tastes a lot like beef, but it's a top five food women should eat for iron replacement. Richer in omega-3 fatty acids and salmon. No steroids, hormones, or antibiotics. They're ranch-raised. They're basically grass-fed. Uh, they live a very natural life of two and a half to three years before they're taken to market. They don't spend any time in a feedlot. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful product. And actually, if you have any kind of heart issues, you go to your doctor, he'll tell you you can eat bison, but he doesn't want you to eat red meat. So <clears throat> we try to tell that story, and we also try, try to be environmentally sensitive. So um, what, I was on the NRA board, the Turner Foundation, funded for five years the <coughs> conserve movement, which moved the entire industry to, to um, be more environmentally and sustainably minded using recycled materials, et cetera. One quick story, I mean, we, uh, we reinvented the paper straw. I made a really bad business decision back then. So when I was starting the company, I wanted to, I wanted to have you know, no plastic, no non-recycled materials, in, in, particularly in to-go wear. That worked OK all the way up till we got to straw. And I remembered being old enough that they had paper straws when I was a kid. They didn't work very well, but I remembered them. So I Googled, you know, instead of having to go down to the Encyclopedia Britannica after the card catalog, you know, <laughs> I Googled it and um, found this company that in 1833 said that they invented the paper straw in New Jersey. I called them up and I got the president and owner on the phone. Turns out he was a third generation and said, yeah, my grandfather invented it. George, there hasn't been any paper straws made anywhere in the world since 1970. I said, oh. Why well, want some paper straws? And he said, well, I get it. And I said, well, you know, what would it take? He goes, George, I don't know. They haven't been made in since 1970. So we're talking 31 years. So finally he said, you know what? I hear you. I think that that machine is out in the warehouse somewhere. I'll have our guys go look and I'll call you back. A couple weeks later he called me back. He said, well, they found a machine. They think they can make it work. Are you serious? I said, yeah, I'd like to have 10,000 paper straws. He goes, you know, they're coated in beeswax, and they don't work very well. And I said, yeah, I know, but I'd like to have them. He goes, I don't have anything to put them in. They come in big, giant trash bags. I said, that's OK. I'll take care of that. And he, he said, I said, how much are you going to charge me? He said, a nickel a straw. Now, I just want to tell you, a straw costs less than a quarter of a penny. 
right? <laughs> he would give it. So a Nicholas Straw. So I bought 10,000 of them. They showed up in my office. We put them in the restaurant. People hated them. <laughs> uh, so our team came to me and said, George, you know, we got to at least have pa plastic straws. So we'll try giving them the paper straw, but they won't. Well, I uh, uh, said, okay. So they went, well, pretty soon, you know, the plastic straws were out front and the paper straws were in the corner. And after two years, I was doing a moral inventory of where we stood on our environmental stance and where the company was. And I called the guy up. I said, how are we doing on those? paper straws. He said, well, you guys don't hardly buy anymore, but we're doing great. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, after we made them for you, we started to work on it. We've perfected it with a new polymer that's still degradable in 150 days. We're individually wrapping a box up. We formed a company called Aardvark Straw Company. We sold them to the, to the cruise lines because there had been the international water straws. We sold them to the Europeans. He said, we're doing so well, we're building the factory just to make paper straws in Indiana right now. And I said, damn, I should have owned 10% of that. <laughs> uh, it's another life lesson, you know, be careful what you do when you don't ask for enough. But, but anyway, look, I mean, the, the thing about Ted's Montana Grill is we never set out to be the biggest and the strongest. There wasn't enough bison in but here's a couple of things. The bison herd has more than doubled in size. There's over 600,000 bison alive in North America today. That was pillar number one. Pillar number two, the bison ranchers are thriving. Bison went from free, I mean, we had people giving their bison away, at basically at a dollar a pound on the rail, which is, you know, a loss, to 480 to $5 a pound on the rail, so it's highly profitable. There's more and more people coming into the ranching industry. Bison is available essentially in every grocery store in the United States of America and Canada today. Costco is the number one seller. And by the way, the best place to get it, two and a half pounds for about 14 bucks. Um, we went from primal cuts, which is steaks, right? Just for average, you know, the tenderloins, et cetera. We went from only selling nose and having a surplus of middle meats to the opposite, the, the middle meats there isn't enough of for the grind because people are using it everywhere where they use ground beef. And the primal cuts are not, they're in, they're in perfect harmony and balance. And so the industry has really recovered. And like I said, we have 40 successful restaurants. We've been in business for 21 years. Our, our company, we're proud of our company and we, uh, we continue to carry the banner of, of being an environmental leader. Uh, we're not radically environmental, um, but, but we do believe that you can use sustainable practices in your business, and we proved that uh, over these years. And the conserve industry and the, and the restaurant industry has moved in that direction primarily because of the influence of what we did. Ted and I in 2007 went on a self-funded tour around the country and held symposiums and talked to people about it and, and shared with them that you really can be in business. So, you know, here we are today. Um, I have a wonderful management team. We have a great set of core values. We have a very stable environment. And in our country today, uh, the restaurant industry is under pressure. Uh, just last but not least, 39% of all meals away from home last year were consumed in a drive through You have divided the segment into what we call necessary nourishment. It's, that's why Uber Eats, DoorDash, uh, the food bar at Whole Foods, the, the food bar at, at Quick Trip, uh, you know, anything you can think of. Uh, that's why the casual diners now, most of the casual diners have at least two, if not four, ghost kitchens in their kitchen. So if you call up and get uh, certain food, it's actually being made at a Chili's or an Applebee's or anything else. Um, they have seen a s severe decline of 16% of in restaurant dining, but yet a 16% increase in to-go food. And what we have then that necessary nourishment is people know they're not going to get the quality but they have to either feed the kids between soccer matches or on the way home for a piano lesson or whatever, or they're just busy and they just, they know they need to nourish themselves, but they don't really care anything about experience or quality. 
And then what we've seen, which is interesting, is you step up to upscale casual on up. Ted's Montana Grill, Houston's, whatever you want to name it, on up through the, uh, you know, arias and canoes of the world, the chops, the bones, the, the rest of it, you've seen a, an influx of tremendous business, particularly from young people. And what I believe, and I can't prove this, is that those are the people that are out for experience and quality. And a lot of the younger folks, and some of you here could probably back me up, you grew up on casual dining. And that's where you went all the time, and that's not the quality that you want anymore. So they're willing to go out and spend. You'd be surprised how many 20s and 30-year-olds we see in our fine dining restaurants or at Ted's ordering good wine, eating steaks, having a wonderful time, and making it a, an, an experience. And so we at Ted's Montana Grill have, have, have given up all third-party delivery. We have no ghost kitchens, no intentions. We don't put our brand on sale. And we're seeing guest count real growth over 2019, as well as per capita spending. And of course, inflation is real. I mean, everything that comes in our back door is 20% higher uh, or so than it was a year ago. So we're an all-time high there. The pressures are tremendous. So it's not nearly as much fun as it was in the 80s to be in the business, but some of us have been around long enough that we found a way around it, and we're, and at least at Ted's, we're successful still today. So I thank you all very much. I hope uh, I told you some things that maybe you wanted to hear, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Good morning, George. Um, you mentioned right there at the tail end uh, about cost being up 20%. Uh, anything else you can kind of share, just how y'all have uh, strategies around inflation that you've dealt with? Yeah, so there's pressure throughout the entire business model. So last year, the average in-store dining was traffic was down 7%. So we have fewer people coming through the front door, which is our paycheck. Couple that with the fact that the cost of goods sold is up at least four to five percent, and and maybe more. We pushed up some pricing. One of the largest price increases we ever took in in 2022, but it was three percent because we feel like. We can't push our prices any higher. I mean, we're pushing, in some cases, close to a $20 cheeseburger. You're talking about, you know, when we started, it was a $6 cheeseburger. And so if you look around at the menu pricing, it's, it's gone up exponentially. We feel like we've kind of hit our, hit our stride there. So we've had to eat that 1.5% to 2% in cost of goods sold. We have to try to find, figure a way out down the P&L. The, the next big cost in the restaurant industry, or just about anybody's, is labor cost. Well, given the mood in Washington for the last two years, given the tremendous influx of union I influence, given the fact that we sort of flew right by a starting wage of $10 and flew right past $15. And this is a big fallacy. Uh, this is a starting wage. It's not a, they call it minimum wage. It's not a minimum wage. It's, it's, the, it's the lowest wage that we will start you at. So in our industry, we never started anybody at $7 or whatever the minimum wage was. It was always a minimum of 10 or 11 bucks. And as you learn, you grow. So we had an average wage of about $13.80 in 2020. Uh, today, it's 18 plus dollars. So we are up $5 an hour for every hour of labor. Then you have this year, uh, our little company gets three to four hundred thousand dollars a year in mandates because they found a way. The unions have found a way. They don't go to the legislature. They go out and they get a referendum. So if you ask anybody, you know, don't you think that 
they ought to make $15 an hour to work down at McDonald's? Sure I do, and they sign the, sign the lease. So, in, for example, in our downtown Larimer Square, uh, which is in downtown Denver, just this one area, the starting wage is $17.50, just mandated by city council. That means a person that has zero experience, that's 20 years old, 19, 18, 19, 20 years old, never had a job before, wants to start and learn the restaurant business in the heart of the house, we have to pay them $17.50 to start. Well, what they don't understand is inflation up the ladder, right? Joe, on the other hand, has been with me for three years. I'm paying him 18 or $19. Well, he comes in and said, well, $17.50 for, I gotta train this guy how to, you know, do everything. I need 25 bucks an hour. And this is the harsh reality of it. And there's no relief in sight from the, those pressures from both Washington and, and these local communities. Because if we do, we did a survey a few years ago. If you ask the average person on the street how profitable they think a restaurant is, they say 50% margins. And it's 5%. Okay, that's a harsh reality. It's 5% or less nowadays. And the reason they say that is because they do the calculation in their head, right? They go, well, let's see, eight ounce hamburger, I pay 250 pound, that's a buck and a quarter, the bun. You know, nobody takes into consideration the cost to build and operate the building, build and operate the business, and, and actually, you know, make a success out of it. So the pressures are, are, are all down the P&L, and then it doesn't matter, utilities, insurance, um, you know, Nancy was meeting, our CFO was meeting yesterday with all of our insurance people. I went in and said, please, we don't have any money. <laughs> you know, help. So, I mean, it's just up and down. And so we're having to learn to do more with less. We've cut way back on our executive team levels and, and our management levels and asking people to pay them more but to do a whole lot more work. We're running our restaurant uh, restaurants with one less manager than we were and utilizing hourly team members to develop them as hourly wages to, to offset that. And we've had to finally, and, and it's worked, we finally, and I think a lot of other employers have said, you know what, we're just not going to play this game anymore. We're just going to tell you this is what we can afford to pay you. And if you want to start with us, you're going to have a quality of life, quality place to work, and we'll work you into a wage, but we're not going to keep hiring these kids off the street at 25, 22, 25 dollars an hour. So we're stabilizing because we are getting our segment and what we've done, we believe, we are getting increased traffic. So we're back competing with our traffic counts in 2019 and hope to exceed them this year in 2023. So that's that long-term hangover effect of the pandemic and all the rest of it that's going on. Um, you know, I really see a trap for a lot of these chain restaurants that have fallen into that Uber Eats, to-go food, and Ghost Kitchen because sort of like couponing. And if anybody remembers Ruby Tuesdays, who's basically gone now, I mean, they just got addicted to coupons. And when they took them away, they lost all their guest counts. So again, remember, we're only... Oh, we're only as good as the number of people that open the front door and come in and voluntarily spend that day. You know, it's not like we're selling them a car and they have long-term payments or anything. I mean, it's instant gratification, but it's instant out of your pocket and you gotta make that decision. Does that answer your question? Well, I must be really boring. <laughs> good. Good morning, George. Good morning. Uh, right here. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, with respect to the uh, the impact of costs, rising costs, how do you see innovation, uh, innovation through automation coming into your business to help alleviate costs? I mean, I think when we think of restaurant automation, we've seen robots in services, and I mean, I've seen automated robots. At, I think of that in the fast food industry, or, or but how do you see that elevating into fast casual? Yeah, I just, um, I, I don't see it personally, but you have to remember, for example, everything at Ted's Montana Grill is made from scratch that day. When, when you order french fries, we cut a whole potato, and nine minutes later, it's on your plate. When you order a 
cheeseburger, we cut a fresh fine ripe tomato and a minute later it's on your plate. We make our own croutons, we squeeze 40 lemons for lemonade. I mean, we cut our whole fish, we cut steaks. I'm an old fashioned person that believes that quality counts and freshness counts. So you have a segment that has moved to boil in a bag, microwave, commissary food. That saves labor. So that's one of the automations that's throughout every segment. The fast casual and casual diners, yes, they can get away with, first of all, they're self-service. Lots of them have closed their dining room. If you go talk to Dan Cathy, he'll tell you he never wants to open a dining room at a Chick-fil-A again. Sees no purpose in it. They just want to have drive throughs and rightfully so. Um, Again, so you can make some labor saving that way. The robotics work in fast food. Uh, I know, of, you know, robotic coffee concepts, you know, the bowl concept, the, there's all sorts of them. The, there's Rosie the burger flipper at, at White Castle and all the rest of it. I, I don't even want to see us with electronic tablets or or anything such in a full-service, upscale dining restaurant. Again, I said earlier, I think you win, and so far, we are experience and genuine hospitality. Knowing who you are, saying hello to you and goodbye, we did invest in technology uh, at the front door, so we know every time you come in, we should learn quickly what your favorite meal is, what your favorite drink is, so we can walk up to Mr. Davis and say, would you like your martini this evening, or whatever the, the answer is. So those genuine personal hospitality moments in time create an overall experience that people will seek to repeat. And I believe you'll see the fine dining and, and upscale dining, like we consider Ted's, resist all of that. Now, there are some technologies in the back of the house that, that the computers, it'll help generate the order faster and diversify it through the kitchen, but they've been around a long time, and they really aren't customer-facing at all and really won't change the way we do things. I think the biggest problem we have right now is being fully staffed so we can give you that genuine hospitality so we don't find ourselves, you know, short-staffed and takes five minutes for somebody to get to your table or five minutes to greet you at the front door or the bartender's overwhelmed because there should be two and they're making all these fancy drinks and they can't get to you. But that, that's a different problem that would never be replaced by anything mechanical. So I, 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 I like technology to a certain degree. I say this, I, I, I'm going to write a book on how to succeed in the restaurant business. It's 22 chapters long. First chapter is great food. Second chapter says great service. Third chapter says great attitude. Fourth chapter says in a spotlessly clean restaurant. The next 18 chapters say when in doubt, refer to chapter one, two, three, or four. <laughs> we are a very simple business. And when we get beyond that, it's wonderful to have all this data, but if you get buried in the data, you're gonna lose the hospitality and the experience. You lose hospitality and experience, your guests are going elsewhere. That's just my opinion. Um, yes. Um, looking for somebody else these days if something happens and a lack of taking personal responsibility. So being in the restaurant hospital. your peer restaurateurs? Um, I think there's in general uh, a, a, uh, an attitude of um, ignore, deny, and blame others for certain situations that, that take place. So we're constantly doing battle with slip and falls and, and uh, food and the rest of it. I mean, I can't, I'm not going to tell you any of the crazy stories, but, but it, it gets, 
And it, it's a radical few that I don't know whether they're out for a settlement or whether they're out just saying. And then there's, then there's this constant reviewing, particularly on Yelp, of everybody's become a food critic. And it really gets to the point where it's almost absurd. So what we have to do is just be as genuine and as hospitable as we can. And what we teach our people, I've always preached since I've been in this business forever, that we greet people at the front doors if they're coming into our own home. And we never let them leave without us talking to them. And that we're out there present. And if there is an issue, we confront it right then and there. And, and we get to the table and we get to the guests. And when you can do that in person and they don't leave upset about something, you'll get a whole different result because you can mitigate the situation. Uh, once they've left and they decide to fester over it forever and then they start to yelp about it and then they start thinking, you know, there's an old statistic that Bill Marriott, Marriott Corporation said this was before all of this technology we have today that for every, their research, for every great experience someone has uh, in a restaurant or hotel, they tell two people. For every bad experience, they tell 10. Well, I think you can exponentially look at that. For every great experience, they still probably tell about two. But for every bad experience, they go to their number one mailbox or they go to social media and they're telling thousands. And this is just something we've had to, had to deal with. So we did invest in technology that allows them to give us feedback and hopefully instant feedback. And our team of one uh, manages every one of those uh, uh, calls. And we contact the good folks, and we contact the, the, the folks that are upset. And our goal is to prevent them from getting to social media. In other words, if we address it right away, and we address it honestly and, 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 and make the necessary improvements or apologies that we prevent them from going out onto the social networks and saying really ugly things about us. It doesn't always work, but it works a great deal of the time. So I think you have to have your fingers on the pulse of the business, and you have to be out there in the dining room meeting and greeting your guests and knowing what their experience is really about. And if you're going under, you have to say it. So one of the things that this, it, this brings me to think real quickly. So one of the reasons why we got out of DoorDash, we signed up for DoorDash. I, I mean, we were like everybody else. We were, had to have meal counts in order to stay in business a, after the pandemic. And all of a sudden, we looked around. And in an ideal hour in a small Ted's Montana Grill is about 80 meals per hour. And we all of a sudden looked down. And because of that DoorDash, we were having in the six to seven, the seven to eight meal periods, we're doing 120, 130 meals per hour. And we're getting all these complaints from the dining room. We had 13 DoorDash guys lined up at the front door, you know, waiting for their to-go food. There's no way to control the flow. So, you know, when you're making real food for real people it, uh, on demand, you have to control how much the kitchen can actually do versus how many people want to be there. And when they're in the dining room, they can do it. So one of the ways to make certain that, you're, that you avoid catastrophe is, A, have a clean environment where you don't have slip and falls, have a well-trained staff that, that knows how to identify people that might be giving in them a hard time and how we can mitigate it before they get out the front door, and then have, have, have an ability to at least look in the mirror and say, OK, we made a mistake, and now we need to correct it. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but that's sort of where we are. We haven't had an, an uh, exorbitant number of more claims. Have yeah, we're still kind of in an area where we don't have the volume of claims because of COVID. Um, but the general liability claims during COVID, the workers come up, the workers, so, the past year or two. So she's saying just general, we're not any different than when we were. And we had less people, obviously, working for us for a while. I don't know where I am on the timing. OK. Hey, George. Uh, I'm Andrew Rodriguez, Georgia Bison Company. Uh, I just want to thank you for bringing awareness to the bison industry. And, uh, George, well, thanks for being in the Georgia bison industry. That's great. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. Every time I sell meat, they all say, oh, I've been to Ted. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Do you know? Um, uh, uh, what's Ted's fellow's name up there? Up in North yeah, Chris? yeah, Chris. Oh, He's got about 50, I think, now. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's a fun business to be in. Proud of it. Yes, sir. Well, <laughs> well, let me tell you this. Um, I said it earlier, and, and, and I'll tell you a couple of anecdotal stories real quick. But, you know, Ted, Ted uh, is a brilliant, brilliant man. Obviously, we all know that, unfortunately, he's, he's quite ill now. Um, but he's still a wonderful man. He calls me every day, Monday through Friday. And we have a conversation. I'm the only actual partner Ted's ever had. Um, he has another T Turner Enterprises and Turner Ranches run by Taylor Glover, uh, very well known here at Terry School. The restaurants are standalone and they've been that way for all 21 years and Ted's protected our partnership. Tell you a quick story, so I didn't really know Ted, I'd met him, but I didn't really know him. We shook hands out in May, came back and scheduled a meeting at two o'clock uh, at his office at CNN. Well, I'd never been to his office at CNN. I knew there was some security, and I pride myself from way back. My family was from Wisconsin, or a Green Bay Packer fan. Vince Lombardi is one of the greatest football coaches ever. He had a thing called Lombardi time. That's be there 15 minutes early. And I've always practiced. I try to be 15 minutes early everywhere I go. And so I was leaving Buckhead in my office, and I was all scheduled to get down there at, at least quarter to two, if not a little bit earlier. And I thought it would be great. I'd be there in plenty of time. Well, uh, about 2.30, uh, or whatever, about 30 minutes before, I get a call from Scotto's brother, Rutherford, who's at the meeting, and it's like this. Where are you? I went, well, I'm on my way. I'll be there in 15 minutes, 15 minutes early. Don't you know all Ted's meetings start 30 minutes early? <laughs> no, actually, that would have been something really nice to know. <laughs> That could have been information that could have been really helpful. So I, now I'm nervous, right? I scurry down, I make it through this massive security. Well, at the time, he's on the 14th floor of the CNN building, and you get off the elevator, and the hallway is 37 Emmys. And then there's the America's Cup, and then there's the World Series trophy, and then there's his number one assistant, or number two assistant. And, Good morning, I'm here to see Ted. Yes, George, we're expecting you. And then in the Debbie's office, which has got like three, 250 Time magazine covers that he's, or magazine covers he's been on. And she jumps over and says, oh yes, Ted's expecting you. And I go to the double doors to his office and she knocks on the door, Ted comes over and he looks at me and he says, oh George, good thing we had other things to talk about. <laughs> So I'm 15 minutes early and he's, you know, so we sat down and, you know, it was a little nerve wracking, but we put together the deal. That's where he said, I want 10. And I said, we need one. I want 10. We need one. Okay, we'll compromise. We'll do five. And we shook hands again and worked out all the details. And I, but he came to me on the way out. He walked me out the door and he looked at me. He said, George, relax. We're going to become really good friends. We're going to make a lot of money. And we're going to have a lot of fun. So you know what, he is a down-to-earth, most wonderful person to be around. You know, I've been with him, uh, fortunately, in many, many places, and he's never had a band of security around him. He's never, we used to walk the streets of New York and pick up trash. Um, he still walks the streets of Atlanta, picks up trash. He's just a regular guy, and, um, you know, we've enjoyed a tremendous friendship, and so the biggest thing about Ted is, he gives you a 100-yard dash with a 99-yard leash. I want you to think about it. I mean, he, know, he, he, he has an idea of where you want to go, those four pillars. But then he gets out of your way, and he gives you the emotional and moral support and the trust to go do it your way. So he's never questioned what we did. We did have some troubles there in 2009 when we stopped, slowed down the restaurants, and we were forced to close a few. He did look at me one day and say, well, you know, you've got one foot on the banana peel, the other one out the door. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, you know, I don't think you can get anybody else to do this better than I am. And a few years later, I said, you know, you told me one day. And he said, I didn't say that. I said, well, <laughs> actually, you did. But so, I mean, you know, it, it's okay. I mean, um, he's been the most loyal, trustworthy person. I'm proud to call him a really good friend. And... I don't know, you know, we've done a lot together and 
and built something that we're proud of, but it's all on a handshake without a contract. So I, I think he's a man of his word. Okay, thank you all very, very much. Thanks for inviting me. Awesome. Before we end, I think we've got a video to, to show. Yeah, this is just a little uh, four-minute video about Ted's, I think, if Jessica has it loaded right. Ted's Montana Grow represents a great American West. When times were simpler, when people believed in themselves, what it represented, which was freedom and spirit and hospitality and caring for each other. And so as we think about the great American West, the can-do attitude of the people of that time, and we can replace it right now today and have people feel the same way when they leave our restaurant, feeling more confident, happier, and restful as they go forward into their daily life. So everything that we do at TED's reflects our commitment to preserving the great American ideal. And that's why we call it authentic American dining. And that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but to us at TED's, it means serving timeless dishes, handcrafted from scratch, small batches made more often, the hard way, just like cooking for friends and family in our own home. And everything that we serve at Ted's is intentionally familiar. So we take classic favorites like burgers and fries and meatloaf and pot roast, and we elevate and enhance these dishes through careful preparation and premium ingredient selection. Our menu philosophy is very simple. Timeless recipes, honest ingredients, and careful preparations. But it's really the way we prepare our food that makes all the difference. Small batches made throughout the day ensure the taste and comfort of an at-home experience. It's a difference you can truly taste. Nothing could be more American than bison. The majority of the bison served in our restaurants has been raised on Ted's ranches. These are all natural bison that have no added hormones. We serve more bison than any other restaurant in the world. Our all natural bison and certified Angus beef are delivered fresh, never frozen. Our steaks, ribs, and roasts are hand trimmed and cut to order here in our own butcher shops throughout the day. This maintains the premium quality, freshness, and flavor that is unique only to Ted's. Our burgers are iconic. Fresh ground certified Angus choice grade beef, fresh ground bison. Both are ground twice a day, every day. We loose pack those, perfectly seasoned. We put those on the grill. We dome those burgers to seal in the juices. We put that on a bun with amazing toppings. It's the best burger you can get. Our purpose is premium quality, and whenever possible, we source local growers. We hand wash, cut, prepare all of our product every day, from the roasting of our corn to the slicing of our own vine-ripe tomatoes. We are passionate about providing our guests with the best. Every shift, we hand wash and prep our proprietary potatoes. They are unique to tits and grow to our exact specifications. Each potato is hand cut and fried to order. We hand slice our onions, and then we let them cure so they reach that crispy, golden texture. At Ted's, it really is about the attention to detail. Everything from the hand-cut fries that we serve here, which are amazing, our fresh-cut half-sours. We're talking about food that is carefully prepared from scratch with honest ingredients, small batches throughout the day. It's as close to how it was prepared 100 years ago because we know our guests come to experience a time and place in American history. At TED's, it's our commitment to perfecting the smallest details to make the difference for our guests. You'll see that in everything we do. No compromises, no shortcuts, no matter what. From greeting our guests with a bowl of hand-cut half-sours to our genuine hospitality, I know it's my job to make sure that all of our guests leave feeling better than when they arrived. We take great care in the preparation of our food, always fresh from scratch, and the care of our guests because we know they expect to connect to a time and place that was simpler and somehow perceived as better. I come to TED's because I feel like it's a piece of America that's missing. 
and we're trying to get back to. It's the whole idea of the land of the frontier, the bison, and Ted's is doing a really great job of bringing that back home. What a great way to... What a great way to end today's uh, talk. Uh, I think we should all go to Ted's, <laughs> is what I think. Uh, uh, so George, thank you so much for being with us today. I've got a nice red and white sculpture to present to you. Thank you very kindly. I'll display it by Thank you. Thank you. If we have not yet validated your parking, we'd love to do so. We can do that uh, on your way out. I hope everyone has a great rest of the week. I look forward to seeing you in April. Thank you.